Our next uh, speaker is from the chemistry department. Uh, he's Kevin Schindler, and he's going to talk uh, about the soil, soil analysis of plastic uh, in laboratory areas. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Schindler. I got the uh, opportunity to work with Dr. Nelson, and we did a uh, soil analysis of one, two, plus in the Laverne area. So to start off with an overview of basically what we did, uh, I'm going to give a background of what, what is lead and that kind of uh, aspect and how it relates to light. Uh, the physiological effects in children, pregnant women, and adults in general. EPA regulations in uh, paint and soils, uh, paint and soils specifically, one because it was our soil samples and uh, paint just because we, uh, we believe that that's where a majority of the lead would have come from just due to the Methods of uh, the experiment, the results we actually found in a brief discussion. So to start off with the characteristics of lead, lead is uh, atomic number 82 on the periodic table. In nature, it's actually found as lead 2 plus. Its other oxidation state is 4 plus. The reason for the 2 plus is just uh, with the loss of the two electrons, it will actually make uh, the S orbital a little bit more st uh, stable. Uh, it's solid at room temperature, which means when it's found in nature, you're going to find it as a solid metal. And uh, it has various com uh, commercial uses. So health concerns. Uh, in children ages 6 or younger, uh, this, is, uh, this group is usually one of the most affected. Um, it can affect any organ in the body, and it mainly will affect the nervous system, and it can lead to potential or permanent brain damage, or problems with their development and uh, or cause anemia. In pregnant women, it can lead to miscarriages or um, uh, premature birth. Uh, and in adults, it's not as bad as in children and women, but it still um, should be taken seriously. Uh, but in adults, it can cause cardiovascular problems uh, or reproductive problems in both males and females. So history of commercial use. Paint, uh, why did they use lead in paint? The reason is because uh, lead actually helped with the durability of paint. It would keep it resistant to moisture. Um, it would uh, actually, it, it could actually give it good color and uh, it, uh, it would just increase basically the lifetime of how long the paint could uh, survive on whatever you're using it for. So two compounds that were particularly used were lead to chromate, which would give it a nice yellow color, and lead to sulfate, which gave it a really nice white color. Uh, they were eventually replaced though with less toxic chemicals. Uh, and then gasoline. Gasoline is another, uh, since the fuel was used so uh, frequently in the uh, early 1900s, they would actually use lead to increase the octane level. And uh, around 1973, it was shown that uh, two to three grams per gallon were used, uh, equated to around 200,000 tons of lead a year. Uh, so this could be a pot uh, potential cause for any form of air pollution, water pollution, or uh, soil pollution, which is a particularly what we're looking at. Other uses include batteries, cable, co uh, cable coverings, and plumbing, just basic commercial uses. So EPA regulations, they stopped uh, the use of lead in paints around 1978. This, this was just strictly when the companies could no longer produce uh, uh, lead in their actual product. However, anything that they still had in stock, they could still potentially sell off. For fuel, uh, in 1996, that is when the Clean Air Act stopped any form of lead being used in gasoline. Even if it's smaller amounts, it was completely stopped. Uh, but even though we stopped it a little bit earlier, this is the main problem with environmental effects, is that we still see it today, we still see the effects today of what happened before. So particularly looking at soil in my sample, the EPA allows uh, 1,200 ppm, which is parts per million, of lead in bare soil where you don't have a high population or density of children. So that would be something like a school, a playground, that kind of idea. Uh, if it is in one of those areas, it needs to be around 400 parts per million or less. So for my particular experiment, 
We actually collected samples from old homes in Laverne. This was just due to the fact that we felt uh, since paint has, uh, since they used to use lead in paint, if we went back to a house that was a little bit older, then if paint had chipped off and went into the soil, we could potentially find lead concentrations. So after the samples were collected, the samples were dried uh, in, uh, in an oven at about 70 degrees Celsius for a week just to remove any moisture uh, and dissolve the nitric acid, which takes forever. <laughs> I just can't stress that enough, so I wish I would have known that. But <laughs> basically, the soil was put in beakers and concentrated uh, nitric acid was used. Uh, we used actually a molar just to keep it, uh, just to give it an aqueous solution so that the ions could, uh, could form in the aqueous solution. After that, it was gravity filtered to remove any form of organic material that would have been dissolved. Um, and while it was dissolving, standards were set up using lead to nitrate. And the standards that were particularly used were 150 parts per million, 125, 100, and 75. And uh, any other concentrations that were set from there were diluted from so once the standards were set up, the samples were run through an atomic absorption spectrometer, and they were from the standards were then put onto a calibration curve to figure out the concentrations of the unknown sample. So to give a brief overview of an atomic absorption spectrometer for anyone who doesn't remember or has never heard of that, uh, we can actually pick a specific uh, element lamp. So in this case, we knew we were looking at lead, so we have a, a lead lamp. And the sample is actually connected, or can, uh, a capillary tube is put into the sample, which will draw it up, while two other tubes uh, bring in a, a fuel, which in this case was acetylene, and an oxidant, which is just air. And when those two combine, it will create the acetylene flame, and uh, uh, the sample will be pulled into the flame, putting them into their individual ions. The instrument can actually be set to a specific wavelength, and this wavelength was uh, 200, 283 nanometers, uh, just because that's where lead will actually absorb. So once it's put into the, t uh, the detector, it'll give us an absorbance of just the lead. So for results, I mainly want to focus on samples one through four, because five is a side thing that I'll get to a little bit later. But um, for sample one, it was taken eight inches from the house, and it was just the surface soil. And as, uh, as we collected the other samples, we went down two inches, four inches, and 5.5. The 5.5 is due to it getting a little bit harder to dig once we got down deep enough. <laughs> so uh, a gram was used in each. This was mainly due to not being sure if we were going to see any lead, so we wanted a good amount of sample size. And uh, the, looking at the first one, we had about 789 parts per million of lead in the soil which is relatively high, uh, but they're not representative values uh, because of some problems with the DI water pedal I'll also cover a little bit later. Uh, but for a sample calculation for setting up the standards, this one in particular is 150. Uh, parts per million is the same thing as saying milligrams of uh, your solute over kilograms of whatever your solvent is. In this case, our solvent was water, and kilograms is the same thing as saying uh, one kilogram is the same as saying one liter. So then we could just do a gram to moles ratio using their molecular weights and convert it into lead nitrate, which was the compound we were using to set up our standards. So a calibration curve. Uh, this is my calibration curve in particular. What, what it's used for is just setting up standards in order to find what your unknown, uh, what an unknown sample is. So on the x-axis, I have uh, parts per million of the lead to nitrate. And on the y-axis is the actual absorbance that was given out. Uh, the, for the actual experiment, we went up to 150 parts per million, but the linear range actually, it, it kind of wasn't as linear, because uh, when you use a calibration curve, you want to stick to the linear region. And as it went out, it was getting less linear, and the majority of the samples were actually only around 40 parts per million for the calibration curve, so we could just use the first five points. Uh, the R squared value is good, and we have a slope which allowed us to actually calculate the uh, actual part per million of the lead. So that's just a simple calculation using the equation of the line and eventually using the sample weight to get the part per million of the lead. And looking at 
um, my particular sample uh, from sam going from sample one to four, it's actually nice to see this trend because it's actually decreasing as we went deeper into soil, which is kind of what we didn't expect. We thought it was going to get a little bit more concentrated towards a, as it went in. And so you can actually see that as we went deeper, it actually begins to level out. So we kind of extrapolated that if we had continued, if pretend we would have seen a level out in the curve in, our, uh, in the bar graph entirely. Um, so for the discussion, the main reason why the um, why the values aren't a good representation is because we were actually having problems with the DI water when I set up the uh, nitric acid solution, in which we found out we had uh, fluoride ions in the water. And so what happens is lead can precipitate out as lead chloride. And so when we filtered it, we could have potentially lost some lead in that sense. So these values could potentially even be higher, which is a little bit of a problem. And so that, that's the thing, though, is even with contamination, we still saw fairly high, uh, high amounts of lead. And so future work, uh, talking about sample five, I didn't want to bring that up, but sample five was just to look at the fuel aspect of when fuel was used. We pulled a sample from uh, about 18 inches from the curb to see that on a busy road if that actually had an effect and that uh, blood concentrations were a little bit higher due to fuel. Uh, the concentration ended up being a little bit low, so it was a little bit difficult. We might have to pick somewhere that's a little bit busier in an area and has been there for quite a while. Uh, another, uh, another, for more future work, we actually still have the samples that were collected, so a retest for lead can be done just to check the values, as well as a test for copper, because copper is another metal that is highly commercial or commercially used for plumbing and uh, even used in paints. So for my acknowledgments, I'd really like to thank Dr. Nelson for all his help in taking the time out to help me do this, uh, University of Lavend and the Chem Department for the opportunity, Andrew Miller for all the help with my senior project, and friends and family.